Thank you, Mara, for the introduction. Um, I, I stood side stage so I could get on quick because it's going to be a really rapid uh, session. Um, <coughs> I'd like to begin by uh, acknowledging traditional owners of this land. It was great to hear and, and learn so much uh, first day yesterday about the history of this place. And it's uh, Im important for me today to acknowledge as well the Indigenous voices and, and uh, communities I visited as part of Artists Exchange. Most recently in October, we were at the Bunya Mountains, which is depicted here. Uh, all the photographs in this presentation were taken by my colleague at the gallery, um, Joseph uh, Rookley. So um, it's particularly interesting to, to touch on uh, the Bunya Mountains program because it is a site that is known as an Indigenous Parliament in terms of its history of the Bunya gathering. So to uh, be touching on an Indigenous Parliament in Queensland standing here in Canberra is is uh, kind of an honour in a way, um, particularly if there are some of you who have not heard of the history there, uh, which I'll touch on briefly later. So as the head of learning, um, I cover three particular deliverables and they all uh, overlap. So access, education and regional services, um, for which Artists Exchanges really sits within our regional services portfolio, but is all about education and access as well. So. Uh, it was born out of the, the fact that our regional workshops were the weakest part of our regional services portfolio, whereas in my view as a teacher, uh, they should be the strongest. Um, so it's an incredible opportunity as the head of learning at Quagoma with such a strong mandate for servicing the entirety of regional Queensland that I can bring, uh, get myself out of the office and go and see all of this beautiful and diverse country and meet these amazing people that are out there doing the work that you all do as well. Um, <clears throat> And also, in, in view of the fact that we too, as the NGA is, um, are working towards a dedicated arts learning space at the Queensland Art Gallery near the Watermall, uh, which was potentially a two-level massive enterprise. And um, I'm very mindful to make sure that I want, to, um, I want that space to be relevant to regional Queenslanders as much as those who uh, can access it more easily and regularly. Um, having taught in regional Queensland myself, this is a fantastic opportunity for us, and uh, Artists Exchange is very much about consulting and getting out and finding out what people need from us as we work towards that end goal. So we, the Artists Exchange program was really about two components. So it's a workshop for students, which we won't, I won't touch on today, but really it was also about consultation and bringing together, which is very much influenced by the last NVAEC, which I attended my first one, about this idea of bringing together uh, educators working in schools, in universities, in galleries, uh, in aged care, you name it, and also artists like the three we heard from earlier today who are actively engaged in education in those regional contexts. Uh, so we did 16 round tables uh, across a period of 16 months, and as you can see with that colour coding there, we broke it down into three phases, three rotations, and that was all about recognising the great diversity, the great um, points of difference in terms of history and culture and complexity, across our great state, and uh, there's still a lot of empty space there we need to cover. So what we did is we, we connected with regional councils through their regional galleries, and they oftentimes invited from people in neighbouring councils as well. So what you see there is only a sort of a sample, um, and uh, really it was kind of major centres through to what we call the regional donut. They're just right on the edge of Metro, and then also through the central and western areas of Queensland. And we went out to ask really, uh, firstly, what's the story? So without putting any kind of framework on top of it, what's the story? Um, we also spoke about the framework of four fields of practice, which I'll touch on, and we finished each of those round tables with a very tough question for creative people, what's the ask? What do you want, what do you need? A tough question because they would often respond by saying what they will do to solve the problems rather than what they actually want. Um, and we tried to make it very clear that we needed to know about each region specifically, mindful of the fact that state and national influences and global influences would impact, impact on each local region, but to really capture the stories from each region, we asked to record through our roundtables what are the challenges, uh, successes and opportunities, so a simple SWOT analysis, but we really put the emphasis on time, so what's current, what's upcoming, what's future. And through doing that, um, jumping over lots of information here for the sake of time, some trends started to emerge. So in terms of challenges, there were uh, socioeconomic factors, there were um, basically context issues around climate, around population coming and going, um, you know, the influence of mining, etc. 
uh, issues around ice. So there were quite serious issues in a lot of these communities. Uh, then there was the perception issues, the perception of what is the value of art education, uh, what is the value of arts, what is the value, uh, you know, this idea that uh, my council doesn't care, the mayor doesn't care about arts, parents don't want to enrol their kids in art, you hear it all the time. Uh, and then obviously within all of that as well, if the care factor's not there or the perception's not there, there are issues with structures and infrastructure to house art, to, to create spaces for learning. Uh, Flipping then, after we've spoken about some of the elephants in the rooms and gotten down all the problems uh, that each, count, each community was facing, we then started to look immediately at the positives, which was a great change to make um, at each round table. And really what we were starting to find out was conversations about what is success and what does success look like? What are the patterns? So the patterns were when communities were connecting with communities within their community. Um, and over time, these reoccurring programs that were of value, school exhibitions, you know, major regional events, were starting to get more nuances and, and more opportunities for outreach and mentoring. Um, and there were residencies and professional development. So really vital places where there was um, a smorgasbord of opportunity for learning across all sorts of spectrums and needs. Um, so pattern, a very simple pattern emerged at each round table where we could, without imposing our view, because we were just there to hold up a mirror, to just be able to say, in terms of identifying your future opportunities, make sure, where possible, that they're identifying the challenges you've all just highlighted and also building on the successes. So sometimes that simple idea that doing less is quite radical, to go back to zero, to let something go that might be a really loved program for one or two people, but actually scale it back so you can do what you really need to do and do it well. And sometimes those things can be really obvious and therefore hard to see, even if it's staring you right in the face. Um, so that's a quick, quick grab about the broad story that we gathered. Uh, then we started to apply a couple of specific uh, lenses, so four fields of practice. And those four fields of practice for me at, in my job is about um, not breaking down art education into primary, secondary, tertiary, or access education and regional services, but these kind of four fields where there is lifelong learning. So whether you're young or old, you can engage with these things. They're also unique in terms of um, potential sponsorship opportunities are different for each of these things. The artists you'd be working with are different for each of these fields. Um, so just to quickly take you through those, arts learning for us was really about process and uh, identifying what is unique about art, what is essential about the arts. Um, and I really love uh, Dr. Anna Cutler's comments on that at the Tate, the head of learning there. Uh, one thing in particular she talks about, which has been touched on um, right from uh, the director's comments yesterday and on a number of occasions since, this idea that the arts and art education can enable people to move from the abstract to the tangible, to build a bridge from something that's known to not known. Um, and bridging came up again this morning. Uh, but also that idea that, you know, well, if there's a perception issue, let's talk about that and let's actually be bold and get up on our soapboxes and say, the arts has, uh, is bountiful in terms of its impact on creative economies and there are really viable and um, amazing careers available to young people uh, through arts learning. Cultural learning, kind of splitting the hairs here between arts learning and cultural learning, but also celebrating what is unique about cultural learning, the idea that uh, you can learn about the world, about others through culture, but you can also learn about your own culture. So, uh, you know, we run distinct programs, for instance, for Pacifica students uh, and Indigenous Australian students up at the gallery, which is slightly distinct from arts learning. Um, digital learning, it's a big, messy thing. In Australia, we're trying to play catch up all the time. For us in galleries, it's about trying to get our collections up online. For schools, it's about trying to get access to those resources. Um, you know, so it's this kind of complex thing where it's not just about taking uh, images of collections and artworks, but also getting the artwork information up there. There's copyright, there's back-end digital complications all through that, but it's a big piece of work. Um, arts and well-being is, again, one that's come up already in terms of the artist therapy talk yesterday. Um, and really breaking art, art as well-being into two kind of fields. One is about accessibility and removing barriers. Uh, for instance, our programs in, in Auslan for the deaf community, and then arts and well-being as a, uh, a kind of responsibility of art educators to really play in it, a, a role in terms of improving uh, and addressing kind of complex issues that individuals face and societies face. 
So taking you through that quickly, I guess jumping back as well, we, we then did the kind of um, SWOT analysis for each of those fields as well and started to identify um, what, what was happening distinct in each region in those fields as well. And then we came to that tough question at the end, what's the ask? And interesting, uh, interestingly, you would think that there was a great diversity in what the ask was. After we got over the, the F word, funding, um, and we got a bit more specific, uh, we looked at space, communication and development. Came up in all sorts of different ways, but really they were all pointing to the same needs and wants. Um, in some contexts, particularly those that were very remote, it was about more exhibi exhibition spaces, particularly A-class exhibition spaces that could take tours from Kogoma and NGA, for instance. Um, places for making, but also just meeting places, places where people could um, have a safe space to develop dialogue. Um, which leads obviously then into communication. And communication is one that came across in a number of different ways, but one was around the networking and planning side of things. For instance, uh, it was countless occasions in those round tables where it would finish by people saying, why don't we get together more often? Why did we wait till Kogoma came? And thankfully, a lot of those conversations did continue on and have been influential in those regions. Um, and it was also about promotion and advocacy. So oftentimes with promotion, um, people don't even know that programs are on. So they'd be sitting at the table and they go, oh, I really wish the regional gallery would do X. Then the person at the regional gallery would turn around and say, we do X, but you don't come. So it's just people don't know about it. And then also that importance of advocacy and, and advocacy on multiple ways, multiple levels. Um, development, obviously it's about learning. So training, mentoring opportunities and the resources and the digital solutions potentially. So it became clear to us that um, the story was just as much about the ask and that those two things are kind of the same. So if you can tell a good story, then your, your funding bid, your ask is going to be more compelling. So we need to get in with these regional councils and help them develop the ask without doing it for them, um, but just being part of the conversation. And that for us takes courage, getting back to the theme. I was told not to do this work when I first came into the role by uh, somebody who advised that big galleries engaging with regional councils can come across like I'm interfering with their relationship with schools, but that was totally not what happened. Um, and so we developed this kind of observation that it was about, if it's more shifting to storytelling, place, people and journey, is achieving those same asks, those same wants. And really, before you could identify what the people, place and journey was, you had to test some assumptions. Like in one town, uh, that idea of people, it came across like they were saying, oh, we don't, we don't have any indigenous people here. And that's kind of crazy, because they do. And, um, and these are creative people that are running a gallery that were saying this. It was more that they weren't confident with engaging with those people. So had to spend some time defining what your art X is. And that can be, that involves events, collections, you know, actually having an identity before you can tell your story. So we went in with more questions than answers. Um, and we knew to go forward after these round tables to develop it into a workshop proper. These are some of the questions we needed to work with regional galleries to, uh, to work through. Um, and an observation as well, I guess, to, we started to develop a bit of a framework out of the trends, things that were coming through, whether they were in the successes, the challenges, or the future opportunities. Um, adult learning and mentorship, you can kind of pair them together, um, because if the adults in the community are stimulated, then they become great mentors uh, for emerging and, and, and student learners. Um, digital solutions, and sometimes that's more complex than everyone thinks, particularly when you go out to really remote Queensland, where there's like daily blackouts. Um, models for leadership and communication, also kind of pairing those together. Um, and in varying degrees, a, a large gallery like Quigoma can help with some of this, but also it's not our place in other parts of that, that work. Um, so this consultation started to fall into a bit of a framework um, that was pairing these relationships together, but particularly between how we can play a role in supporting adults to be, to, in their work as mentors in their communities, and how we can work uh, to create digital um, s inspiration and content. And really, all of this was centred around place. So the digital content needed to be more about regional Queensland places. Um, and we needed to work with people on the ground to help develop those resources so that they can use the resources at the centre of their learning. 
So getting into place then, this is kind of where I shift from that consultation we did to our first workshop um, that we ran in October in the Bunya Mountains. So we wanted to find places that are symbolic, they're layered with history, they're also really beautiful so people want to come. Um, and this is that, it's an ancient Jurassic forest with uh, a biodiversity that's unique globally. Um, and also, smartly, you know, finding a place that's a little bit off the beaten track, but right in the middle of a lot of regional towns with regional galleries and regional schools. Um, so yeah, there you see, just zooming in, uh, you know, a number of the communities we had already worked with and Bunya Mountain smack bang in the middle. So <coughs> um, a big part of um, developing the program and identifying the Bunya Mountains was also about connecting firstly with the First Nations people uh, and the Bunya Mountains. And we were able to do so quite effectively. Um, and as a result, we were, you know, the, the program was so much, so much richer. Um, and this was in part about modeling to the participants what's possible if you do take the time to uh, address cultural protocol before you run a workshop. Um, so we had this amazing smoking ceremony the first night we arrived. The morning, the next day, uh, we went on a bushwalk with the Murray Rangers, who introduced me to trapdoor spiders, which are pretty freaky. Um, and you know, this is such beautiful wildlife around the area. Uh, and just to, to hammer home this identity, this, this information about place, um, you know, this is an example to, to, to visualise what the program was about. You have on the left uh, a young up-and-coming gallery director. Uh, you have a, an artist. Um, and then you have an art teacher. So from each community, from each council, we brought in three, and there was five communities surrounding the Bunya Mountains that came to join us to talk about place and their connection to the place. So shifting then into people, the same sorts of people we did the round tables with, plus the local knowledge through the elders and also um, the, Bunya, uh, the Murray Rangers. So, <coughs> Paul Dawson, the fellow in the foreground there, is an amazing human being, and the Murray Rangers are doing amazing work um, in terms of rehabilitating uh, landscapes, but also bringing back um, historic knowledge. When I first met Paul, we went to this kind of um, not really nowhere place, uh, to me initially, uh, in, in north of Toowoomba. And, uh, we sort of drove in, I was thinking, should I even be here? And then as soon as I got out, it was like the air changed as soon as I got out of the car and it just felt unique. And he sort of said to us, if you see through those fence lines there, um, there's some rock formations out there and we could kind of see it. He said he couldn't take us down there at the time because uh, his uncle wasn't there to take us to the area. And a little girl discovered these rock formations. She said to her dad, who owned a property, I'm gonna go down and see the fairy rings. And they ended up being uh, it ended up being a key marker that uh, young men would travel up, perform ceremony on their way to the Bunya Mountains Festival. And it's overgrown, it's across a couple of fence lines, some neighbours are playing nice, some aren't. Uh, the Queensland government supporting them to, to bring that space back. And those rock formations are older than the, um, the pyramids, for instance. So, you know, the, the history and the work that the Murray, the <coughs> Murray Rangers are doing is, is quite amazing. So they organised um, the smoking ceremony and they also brought us uh, into contact with two of my favourite people on the planet at the moment, Auntie Laleen and Uncle Mal. They stayed with us for the entirety of the second day of the program, which we didn't plan, uh, as well as there for the smoking ceremony. Another key, uh, uh, going through the... Um, Bushwalk, resources right in the heart of the program, a lot of thinking, each regional gallery had to, um, e each regional community had to sort of come up with ideas to solve challenges in their community. Um, but then we also, running alongside that, uh, worked with Flying Arts Alliance, which will come up next. And instead of us as a gallery choosing the artist, again, we wanted to model to the participants that organisations like Flying Arts can connect you with amazing artists like Jenny. Um, who on the side while people were brainstorming was running these gorgeous printmaking workshops um, and taking people on that professional learning journey. Then back in and out uh, into this mode of really beginning dialogue and Uncle Mal was key because he kind of imparted some learning onto me and I kind of flipped the end of the program. So he was talking to me about the value of story um, and so to finish people 
I, I asked people to perform their solutions. And the performances were hilarious, they were emotional, they were really heart moving. And to be honest, it was the best moment of my working year last year. We walked away with prints, and at the end, which was particularly powerful, which we didn't force, we threw it out there, the artists and the galleries are wanting to work together to create a touring exhibition about the history of the Bunya Mountains. So they'll be returning to do their workshops without us, independent of us. If they want a letter of support, we're there. Um, and the art teachers are going to work with us to develop those resources for schools to go online. So instead of a resource about an exhibition, it's a resource about a place. Thank you. Contact details there if you need. Terry's a bit taller than me. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land and this fabulous place that we're meeting in today. Um, Dr. Martin Kirby has decided not to present because he really likes to talk and we only have 20 minutes, so if you'd like to talk to him later, that would be fine. Okay, so welcome to our presentation, Partners in Art and Education, Flying Arts Alliance and the University of Southern Queensland. I'd like to thank our long-standing partner, Flying Arts Alliance, for their input into this presentation, and the CEO, Kerry Ann Farrow, who you would have seen on Terry's slides before, really wished to be here today, but unfortunately couldn't, as um, would John O'Toole, who's the chair of Flying Arts Alliance. We'd also like to acknowledge our colleague Janet McDonald for the work she's undertaken to foster the partnership between our university and Flying Arts Alliance. And also the following philanthropic organisations, which I'll talk about during the presentation. We'd like to acknowledge the John Villiers Trust, the Tim Fairfax Family Foundation and Gandel Philanthropy, and their input will become more obvious as we go through. So, in this current economic and rationalist climate, it's really heartening to find a long-standing 20-plus year partnership between a university and a grassroots community-focused arts organisation. Flying Arts Alliance has provided visual art programs and services to regional and remote Queensland for 47 years, which is outstanding. USQ was established a few years before. FAA began in 1967, and that was after a passionate community push to establish a, a university in Toowoomba in a regional area. So we both, both organisations like to say that regional and remote areas are part of our DNA, and so our partnership began in 1991. Now, you may know this wonderful man, Mervyn Moriarty. He's the founder of Flying Arts Alliance, a passionate artist and educator. He believes everyone is entitled to access high quality art education experiences regardless of where they live. He began the Eastern Australian Flying Arts School in 1971 and through that process he created a two year course taught by contemporary artists. And it gave students an art course previously only available in major cities like um, Sydney and Melbourne at that time. So he saw the need, he, he taught himself to fly, hopped in a plane and just went out, out west and started teaching art, which is fantastic. Eventually membership fees were unable to cover the costs of hiring and fueling a small plane to fly to 18 centres across Queensland because it is the second largest state in Australia with more than half the population living outside the greater metropolitan area of Brisbane. So Flying Arts has adopted a flexible delivery approach. They've, um, they initially discussed technical requirements with USQ because we were the first Australian university to offer a fully online course which is really exciting. And they began to offer online classes in conjunction with face-to-face -face workshops, you know, with budget re restrictions and that sort of thing. And so the high quality of Flying Arts approach and commitment has seen them recently appointed as the Regional Program Administrator in Queensland of the Regional Arts Fund, which is just wonderful. So, as we know, the arts became a curriculum entitlement for every Australian student in 2013 through the Australian curriculum, The Arts, with the f consisting of five art forms. 
However, there are inconsistencies in the way the arts are being delivered nationally, and that's due to a range of contextual factors, including high stakes testing such as NAPLAN, some teachers' lack of confidence in teaching five art forms, you know, sometimes it's hard to just be expert in one, and lack of professional development in some areas. And that undermines the stated equitable provision of the arts for all students. There is a plethora of research, which is up there as well, that reinforces the importance and value of the arts on, on, on students' academic and non-academic outcomes, as indicated. Last year, for example, there was a landmark research project conducted in England by the Arts Council, tracking Australian learning engagement, or TAIL, and it outlined overwhelmingly the positive benefits of the arts and cultural education on the lives of young people. And through this project, Thousands of teachers across the UK expressed concern over the impact of declining arts provision to schools and particularly on future generations. And that, that is a, you know, a constant theme coming through the presentations during the conference. In Australia, there's been increased emphasis on quality learning and teaching. And teachers, as we know, we have the Australian professional standards that have been implemented in the last few years. Um, so, Flying Arts and USQ saw an opportunity to work with teachers, particularly in regional and remote areas, in developing their confidence and expertise in visual art through co cross-curriculum initiatives and collaborations between teachers and artists. And research on arts and teacher professional development indicates there's important areas that need to be addressed, and these include the importance of developing skills and techniques for each art form, including discipline-specific vocabulary and understanding the symbolic languages of the arts. The Australian government has implemented artist-in-residence programs, but of course not every school is able to access that or, or for time and all sorts of reasons. Um, and there is limited funding, so it means that this isn't accessible to all schools. And I'm really pleased to see Lee Fullerton sitting up the back, just wave Lee. Lee was part of this amazing residency with Ravenswood State School. Um, and it was an opportunity to engage in genuine arts experiences. So this is something that Flying Arts has done, um, because we see there's all the emphasis on literacy and numeracy, which of course is important. Um, but in a study last year on artist in residence programs for pre-service teachers looking to specialise in early childhood and special ed, and this is really disturbing, there was a collective lack of positive arts experiences with the researchers noting the competence and confidence of classroom teachers in teaching the arts has been taken for granted. However, teacher confidence has been noted when teachers can draw on areas they're comfortable with, familiar with, and can work closely with an artist, such as Lee, in the development of their programs. And in this beautiful image, we see the students at Ravenswood State School drawing one of the iconic buildings in their town, which linked the visual arts and history seamlessly together. And there's a lovely video of Lee doing this too, if you hop onto the Flying Arts website. Due to growing concerns with the impending national curriculum, and this is how it all came about, Flying Arts invited teachers to a webinar with Arnold April, the international expert in arts integration. Teachers expressed their interest in working collaboratively with artists to address arts and non-arts areas of the curriculum in innovative ways. And from all of that, the Connecting Arts to the School Curriculum project was conceived and designed by the then CEO of Flying Arts, Stephen Clark, and USQ Associate Professor and board member Janet MacDonald. So this program's been designed for primary middle school educators and artists located in regional and remote areas. It uses a genuine integration arts model in which instruction is always presented through the arts. The, the 2018 independent review into regional, rural and remote education surprisingly found that teachers in these areas are effectively excluded from involvement in high stakes professional development. In these areas, it's important when it's informed by local knowledge, as we all know. We talked about bringing our own stories into the classroom and students doing that as well. We need to shape content and context which is relevant to participants. And this um, principle has underpinned all the CASC projects. So with this in mind, schools were chosen that were regional or rural, and there were six, oh, sorry, three stages 
um, which are providing a little more detail up there, but just due to the time, I might keep going through there. But just quickly, um, stage one was six PD workshops, and then stage two, uh, six 90-minute classroom case studies, which are all documented on the Flying Arts website, and stage through a webcast summary with Arnold April, John O'Toole, and other members of the team to um, talk about the findings from the project. So the aim of the project was to develop a new teaching and learning model to promote arts and art experiences in schools through teacher-artist collaboration. A reflective practitioner model was implemented with learning occurring through self-discovery, which as arts people, we know that's so important. Artists and teachers shared their experiences and they reflected on the most appropriate way to integrate their professional knowledge and skills together. The initial CASC project was therefore practical rather than theoretical. And in this example, we see art and science being used together there really well. And it was really successful. The concept has now grown. It's been taken up by primary schools in Queensland. Some have sourced their own funding for artists to work with teachers in their schools. And that's a really lovely quote from the 2016 annual report from Flying Arts capturing um, the success of the program. And in addition to donating art supplies to all the schools involved, FAA has made the case studies and teacher-artist collaboration notes, so the raw notes between the teachers and the artists, available on their website as freely available resources for teachers, any teacher, you don't have to be a member, to access those. It attracted substantial funding from the John Villiers Trust and Tim Fairfax Family Foundation, which is wonderful and shows the, the real merit and worth of the project, and particularly what those organisations stand for. So then that's evolved into the Small Schools Mentorship Program. So the important recommendation from the CASC project was for Flying Arts to focus on small rural schools. So this mentorship program was established in 2015 and provided for a dedicated mentor to work with teachers to assist in implementing the Australian curriculum, the arts. And it showed how it was possible to genuinely integrate arts and non-art subjects together. The outcomes of the project are also available as well as the lesson plans on the Flying Arts website. Further refinement of the small schools mentorship program established then the current small schools program. So this program is targeted at regional and rural schools in Queensland with less than 50 students, which the decision was made because a lot of these schools don't have the resources that this would be a wonderful way to target. So just a little more detail there about that. And the model was developed as it's evolved through the projects and it demonstrates the important components of the small schools program. And as you can see there, particular emphasis has been placed on the relationship between the teacher and the artist. And we call that the professional learning community. And it leads through around to benefits for the students and the school community. And one of the teachers described how the PLC had broadened their concept of arts integration. Um, she said, it's funny because when we train to be teachers, we learn to do all these lesson plans, to use our time really effectively, to make sure the 70 minutes are used properly. Last year I was in that headspace, but now she can see how that can be integrated during the whole day. The model acknowledges the following aims of the small school program, which are up there. Sorry, I'll need to keep going though. Just give you a little chance to have a quick look. And just moving on to one of the small schools. So Dalveen is between Stanthorpe and Warwick. It's a really small school, less than 50 students. And they did a project called Why Study Birds? So the teachers put forward their interest in what they'd like to do. And this was a collaboration with the Stanthorpe Pottery Club and the Stanthorpe Men's Shed. So both wonderful organisations. And you can see there one of the students on the left with their ceramic bird and on the right with the students with their, their bird houses. So the aims I just showed before are evident in projects such as this one. Of, and um, it, it was such a positive outcome for also the two organisations involved. And of the 24 case studies that are on the Flying Arts website to date, and according to the Australian Statistical Geography Standard, which looks at you know, very remote and metropolitan, of those case studies, two have been major city, three in a regional, 10 out of regional, four remote and five very remote. And I think that's such a tribute to the work that Flying Arts is doing. Um, I found it really interesting when we started to analyse the case studies. Now, as I said before, the teachers ask 
for the areas they'd like to really focus on. And as a breakdown here, the analysis showed us that the major curriculum areas from the CASC and the small schools mentoring program and the small schools program um, shows a clear leader there. Can you see which one? Science, yes, science. And that's really interesting, followed by history and then has and not the priority areas of literacy and numeracy, but that may be because there's so much information available on those areas already. And the sci science topics have been really diverse and included things like space, energy, chemistry, drones, droids, robots, reptiles, birds, plans and recycling. However, I think given the creativity inherent in science, um, people like Leonardo da Vinci showed us that, it's not really surprising. But there could be more analysis about why some of the other ones aren't being picked up. So the interest in the success of the small schools program has recently attracted funding from Gandel Philanthropy, and that has allowed Flying Arts to now double the schools they're able to fund through that program. And having taught out west for five years, I'm really heartened to hear that. I think that's just a wonderful, wonderful resource for teachers in those areas, and they can feel really valued. And the Small Schools Program has developed from that initial CISC program. It responds to the importance of ensuring teachers in regional and remote areas obtain appropriate and relevant PD in the arts. It provides time for teachers and, and artists to work constructively together, enhancing both of their professional development. And I was really heartened to hear the artist talks this morning with the artists working in schools. I just think that's a lovely, mutually beneficial collaboration. Kerry Ann Farrah, the CEO of Flying Arts, noted the number of applications received for funding has confirmed there's a really high demand for arts in the classroom and teachers from these rural and remote areas need support from practising artists to boost learning outcomes across all curriculum areas. And that's, that's another little tiny school, Heville State School, and they were looking at art, English and science, but I just love the look on the students' faces. We know when they're really engaged and, and learning through literacy and learning through the arts and, and learning other areas is just so powerful. Um, and as part of our partnership, these are some of the um, initiatives that we've been involved in. Um, the Art Is Workshop residency program is like a graffiti art experience and school students can come in, have a taste of university life. And at the moment, we've just had that happen and our tennis courts look amazing now. All the walls have been graffitied in a really beautiful way. We also have the um, Connecting Arts to the School Curriculum webinar program with a number of USQ students and staff presenting with that. Um, in the middle of the year, we're going to have a residency for um, mid-year and experienced artists. And we're working on education kits, which is fantastic. And John O'Toole has provided endorsement for that. And as the lead writer for the Australian Curriculum of the Arts, that's pretty special. Um, we have flying arts people contributing to the Art Education Australia Journal as well. And we're undertaking research on the Small Schools Program. And I just wanted to finish with this beautiful picture of one of our Bachelor of Creative Arts students, Carrie McPherson, who ran the Art Is Residency Program. So all of those opportunities for both organisations have been so valuable and enriching. And, and it's wonderful to hear the work that the Queensland Art Gallery is doing as well. And there's so many exciting things happening in Queensland. So, <laughs> so thanks very much. Sorry. Before we start, we'd just like to start, firstly, with an acknowledgement. We acknowledge the contemporary Tasmanian Aboriginal community of Lutruwita, who have survived invasion and dispossession, and continue to maintain their identity, culture and Indigenous rights. We pay our respects to the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples and recognise them as the traditional owners and ongoing custodians of the land upon which this gallery is built. As part of the work that we do in Tasmania, I have a particular colleague there who I'm very fond of, has always encouraged me to, you locate yourself in the space from which you come, and you share something about that country from where you come. So I live on the country of the Panana and the Lederamerina peoples 
of Luchawita, Tasmania. And pictured here is Punch Bowl Reserve. And this is just down the road from my house. And it's a natural rock fissure. It has an indigenous name, um, Loini Mungalina. So she's always encouraged me to, wherever you go, share something about the country upon which you're fortunate to live and work. Thank you. And I live in Hobart, Nipaluna, and I acknowledge the Muanina people as the custodians of that land. So now we will tell you a little bit about ourselves. This is a bit weird. I know, it's a little bit sorry. sorry. Anyway, okay. Okay. Sorry. So um, in terms of locating oneself is also about um, the place, but also the person. So I am of, I'm an Anglo-Australian of first generation on my father's side and I think fifth on my mother's of Scottish ancestry, primarily cattle thieves, and on mum's side, convicts. <laughs> I work at UTAS as a senior lecturer in arts education, and I primarily work with Bachelor of Education and MTeach students studying to become arts teachers. My personal background is in visual art and media art in terms of my own training and my work as a practising artist and curator. I'm Vice President of Art Education Australia and I am fortunate to be working here with my colleague Jane, who will tell, her, tell you a little bit about herself. Yes. So I'm a first generation Australian. My parents are 10 pound poms who came here in the 1960s. I grew up on Wurundjeri land in Melbourne, Victoria. I work in curriculum services in the Tasmanian Department of Education as the curriculum leader for the arts, and that's all five art forms that I need to cover. So I'm responsible for curriculum writing, professional development, um, and implementation of the Australian curriculum. But my background is dance and drama. I was a senior dance and drama teacher for 25 years, and I've also worked as an actor and a divisor, voiceover artist and choreographer. Um, I completed a Master of Drama Education uh, with honours from Griffith University. I'm flirting with a doctorate <laughs> sometime. Um, I don't know, not getting serious about that just yet. Uh, and we feel that it's really important as, as aesthetic educators to find your people. Um, Abby and I were bound to cross paths in Tassie. It's a small place. We're both in the art education field. But we are in different institutions. We are in different generations. And we come from different art forms. But we've created a really strong collaborative working model. And we're trying to look at why we've done that. So part of that is that we have this zealous belief that every child has the right to a rigorous, rich and contemporary arts education. We really believe in the empowerment of teachers through really strong, well-resourced and highly engaging professional learning opportunities. We like to create communities and connect people with each other. We're both prepared to take risks at times. And I think we're both a little bit goofy and we like using a sense of humour um, in our space because that can be a really good and underestimated um, collaborative strategy. Just before I skip past that, that's just to give you a little bit of a con a bit more of an idea there of some of the, um, we've talked about place, person, but also some of the platforms through which we've been working together with a whole range of different stakeholders, all of which are really invested and come into that idea of arts education is important um, for different reasons and things that we will go into a little bit further. So what we're going to share with you today are three examples of collaborative practice that we've, we have engaged in. Firstly, in away from each other. So the first one, I'll talk about education kits, which Margaret has just touched on a little bit in that first presentation there. Then Jane's going to tell you a little bit about another a dance and drama professional learning initiative. And at that point is when we first started to get to know each other and sound out how we would work together. Yes. And then the third one is the STEAM Horizon Symposium, where we had come together to work under that premise of what is STEAM, how is it happening, and what does it look like in Tasmania. So actually, just down here, I've got a range of, I don't have enough for everyone. But if you get down here really quick at the end of the presentation, I have printed out a selection of education kits um, to share with you. The Hadley's Art Prize one is freely available from the Hadley's um, Art Prize website. The Albatross Island one is quite new. It is very, it's pretty special. Mm. Just recently this has been built around a, a short documentary 
called Namana Rooney um, Albatross Island, which has just won a it's winning international awards um, and has been shortlisted as one of the finalists for the Banff Mountain Festival. It's an incredible film that's been put together by an artist called Matt Newton who works in Tasmania. And um, I highly recommend that you jump in and have a look at that. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of these are some of the things that have come out of the collaborations that I've been working with teachers, with professional associations, with uh, industry people. But what I wanted to share with you, and I'm sure you're interested in, is well, how does it actually happen? What needs to happen to get to this as an end product that we can give out to teachers to help streamline some of their processes with their time poor, they're really busy. So we're in a, pri a privileged position here, I know we're in my work. So I need to be able to look at what I'm doing to make sure I'm best serving the arts education community. And this is something that I can do to help. So this little excerpt here, for the Albatross Island Education Kit, there was a professor that works in environmental law at UTAS. So UTAS kind of instigated this, this space where he was interested in getting together a whole range of people from different positions around um, cultivating a conservation mindset, so taking care of country and the environment. He was really interested in how we can better do that. And to do that, for this collaboration to work, there was, that was the question, that was the agenda. If we can get a whole range of different people together from, from various positions of investment in this particular idea and hear why, and how country and environment is important to them. We can't do anything until we know that. So we had representatives from the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. We had representation from the art teacher community through the Tasmanian Art Teachers Association. We had conservation groups, so the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. There's some information down there for you to have a look at there too. Farmers who were working on the land. So everyone had quite different investments in this, in this idea of the environment and why it was important. So what was important to bring together, and for, to let something like an education kit come out of that, was to have all of those different intersecting, very different views, and look at how we can kind of, we can include them, yeah. <laughs> basically, and make, make sure that we are aware of them. So that's just one little example to give you a sense of that process. Jane will tell you about Impart. So Impart was a two-day dance and drama conference um, and I wanted to change the narrative about arts education, that it's about ways of working um, using very powerful and transformative learning experiences for young people. And I had internationally and nationally recognised speakers like Professor Robin Ewing and Dr Katrina Rank coming down. But that photo there is of Dr Rachel Jacobs from the University of Western Sydney and she came to talk about decolonising the curriculum. And so she used Bollywood dance um, as a way to deconstruct um, and uh, embody um, that cross-curriculum priority of um, Asia and Australia's engagement with Asia. So it was a really conscious decision to uh, intersperse the conference with those times of theory and pedagogy for teachers and then getting up on the floor and embodying them. Um, so we've got the mix of the kinesthetic and the intellectual um, and the emotional and the embodied. The actual professional learning experience is modelling that itself. Um, we put the whole conference, all the resources, the films from it, um, there are a couple of films made from it, onto our learning management system um, on the Department of Education learning site which is called Canvas, um, so that teachers could go back and ex access all these resources. Um, and we gave the teachers curriculum snapshots. Um, and these are resources that we have developed in the um, department because like Queensland, uh, as Marg was talking about, um, we have lots of teachers who don't access uh, professional development opportunities and also we just have less of them down in Tasmania. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the capacity as you would do in the larger states. And what we do in these um, snapshots is encapsulate the Australian curriculum, the three dimensionality of it, and do a lot of that work for the teacher and then give them ideas of a lesson units, resources, plans, ideas uh, to help them incorporate um, the cross-curriculum priorities, the general capabilities. We highlight the content descriptors from other subjects. For example, if you're doing mathematics in year three, you need to learn about symmetry. So we've got a great dance thing where 
Kids can get up and dance and do that. Um, but I've down here, I've got print examples of the visual and media arts. I'd really love you to take them. They are mostly primary for the visual, um, but I've got some media arts. If you're a media arts teacher, um, up to year 10. Um, and media arts is something which uh, we, we're trying to help to. Um, we've deliberately tried to use um, Tasmanian Aboriginal examples, female artists, just to implicitly play with decolonising and, you know, looking at gender equity in the actual curriculum resources ourselves. And I collaborated with the senior project officer in visual arts because I, that's not my expertise background. And, but we'd have lots of big conversations about what are the big ideas that link all the arts. And I've really loved listening about what you do in the visual arts about identity and how you would do that and how I would do that in a drama classroom. And then how I would maybe could work across that. Um, so we want to allow those moments of real empowerment for the students, but also teach strong, rigorous skills and techniques to give them that discipline um, expert knowledge. So we'll move on now to this, the third example that we wanted to talk to you about. So we're kind of scaffolding here from separate collaborations, but then coming together into something bigger. So the STEAM Horizon Symposium um, was a live streamed three site event held across Rosney College in Hobart, the Launceston Big Bitcher School, which is a kind of alternate pathway in a secondary space. And then on our northwest coast at Burnie Primary. So we had primary, secondary and senior secondary and at quite different places around the state. Um, all a part of this sort of sharing of practice. And part of this work too was looking at the idea of really the things we, in our individual spaces of working, we were aware that people were doing really exciting things, their take on STEAM and what it was in their contexts with the materials they had at hand and the interests of their students and so on and so forth. And what we wanted to do is we needed to create a space to just make that visible and invite everyone to come along to get, a, to get a sense of this shared practice. So it was kind of like an opportunity for proof of concept to go, okay, well, there's this thing, STEAM, it is happening in our, in our state and teachers are doing, I'm just where our little definition's gone. Teachers are doing really exciting, brave, bold things with this and not being directed um, and doing it in a very organic, contextualised way. And we wanted to hand over to teachers that power and autonomy and or empowerment to basically say, you show us, mm. show us what you're doing, involve your students in that process. So students were presenting as part of this symposium as well. So they were, it's very teacher and student driven professional learning. To kind of hold us in that space and help steer us along, we came up with our own definition. So that was people who had been involved with the delivery of this professional learning, you know, the conversations we were having with teachers in classrooms, research that we were doing or reading. And this is what we came up with to kind of hold us in that space. As an evolving curricular innovation, STEAM is revealing itself as an ambiguous, audacious and contested space for teaching and learning. And although still evolving, theorists and practitioners broadly acknowledge STEAM as a generative space to cultivate creative, literate and ethically astute citizens and workforce for the 21st century. So this is just a kind of guiding statement that we continue to revisit. It changes, it's shifting, but it was something that it was helpful to have that kind of vision. So what we wanted to share with you now is what are some of the key things that pop out of these processes in terms of what inhibits and what enables these kind of professional learning collaborations in our Tasmanian context. So we wanted to share with you just a few quotes from people who as part of the first stage of analysis um, for the STEAM Horizons professional learning project. Just some of the things that they say inhibit and make it challenging. And looking at that idea too of challenge is not something that is an end point, it's actually an opportunity. So we're kind of trying to revision that, any, that idea of deficit storylines or deficit narratives about we can't do this, um, so what are the opportunities within that? So this kind of interdisciplinary learning and teaching needs multi-level support to work, time, acknowledgement, endorsement and permission from school leadership. 
Our current secondary siloed ways of working makes it really difficult for us to work in interdisciplinary ways. And there needs to be a balance and timetabled space for the interaction to actually happen, coupled with dedicated discipline time, and teachers need time and opportunity to get together to collaboratively plan for authentic integration to happen. And don't underestimate how the physical space works to facilitate and inhibit STEAM inquiry. So these two, just as we go into this sort of, these are the, the little key distilled things that we have pulled out now in terms of what are the enablers. And it's interesting to look at that idea of um, time and space in the literal and metaphoric sense too of the role that we play in creating spaces for this stuff to actually happen where there isn't the mechanism available. Mm. So I'm gonna let you read that, but there's just a few kind of magic keywords in that that we really noticed, and it was looking at that idea of contentions as opportunities. So that being able to sit in those spaces in between challenge and opportunity, and that sort of ties in really nicely to some of the things that have already been talked about throughout the, the keynotes and things so forth. So those gaps, uh, what happens in the gaps and what will they let us do? making and holding space for teachers and students to drive this and be visible and be active, being brave, embody that idea of curriculum as something that is sort of words on a page in a space. What does a lived curriculum look like in context? And what teacher, what, when we find teachers doing incredible things with that, we need to share that to help people who are finding it more difficult. So in the future, if we're going to be looking at how we might activate or mobilise or enact critical quality arts professional learning collaborations, the tensions need to be negotiated and you need to find those people who might negotiate them with you. And we propose that the, tension, the presence of these tensions in our practice and research are no longer served well by re-inscribing storylines of arts education on the margins. When relationality operates as the cornerstone for collaboration, we can include and respect and honour teachers' knowledges, storylines, skills and understandings. Thank you very much. <laughs> We could chat later. We can chat later. Now our um, Twitter handles are there and on my Twitter line is the STEAM Symposium film that was made, it's a three minute little film. We can actually see what it looks like um, because as Abby said, it was in the three spaces at the same time um, and it actually went from one space to another. So thank you very much. Thank you very much to all of our um, recent speakers, to Terry, to Margaret, and in combination with Martin, who forewent for the floor but worked on the projects, um, Abby McDonald and Jane as um, Pooley as well. And now with our short presentations, we are going to have, um, they have 20 minutes, uh, 20 seconds per 20 slides to um, take us through some of their projects and work that they're sharing with us. And so uh, just we will last of all hear from Ria Tierney, who's a visual arts and textiles teacher working in the ACT public school system. And she will be talking about the amazing learning opportunities for Kingsmith Smith senior arts students to create and change in their community through street art. John Irvine will be sharing with us um, about aspects of educational experience for students to be involved in arts programs such as artists in residencies, experiences, overseas art tours and art camps. And he is the head of faculty visual arts at Beacons Hill College in Pakenham, Victoria. And coming up now, we have Pia Robinson from the Queensland University of Technology, Precincts Widening Participation Engagement. And we'll speak about her work which aims to create, um, in, aims at creating aspiration and demystifying careers and study pathways for high school students from low socioeconomic backgrounds. 
just do a quick change of slides. Okay, so I'm pulling seven years in seven minutes, so if you can bear with me, I'm going to talk very quickly. Um, good afternoon. It is my absolute pleasure to be presenting Breaking Boundaries in Widening Participation through Visual Arts Programming. My name is Pia Robinson and I am the Widening Participation Programs Officer at QT Precincts within Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. In keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QT and NGA now stands and recognise that these have always been places of teaching and learning. In connecting with the overall theme of this conference, I stand here bravely with my heart wide open to share with you that I want to make the world a better place. And I believe that this is possible through the power of education and that we can successfully build on aspirations and awareness of further uh, education through the tools of visual art. In the words of Save the Children CEO, Hella Thorning Schmidt, education is the most empowering force in the world. It creates knowledge, builds confidence, and breaks down the barriers to opportunity. For children, it is their key to opening the door to a better life. In Australia, aiming to give these children the access to education is HEP, which stands for the Higher Education Participation and Partnerships Program a federal government initiative which aims to ensure that Australians from low socioeconomic backgrounds who have the ability to study at university get the opportunity to do so. It provides funding to assist universities to undertake activities and implement strategies that improve access to undergraduate courses as well as improving the retention and completion rates of those students. At QT, our focus is partnerships with the majority of HEP funding going towards widening participation programs. These aim to raise the aspirations and build the capacity of people from low socioeconomic backgrounds to, 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 to participate in higher education by developing activities in partnerships with schools years 6 to 12. Specifically, QT's engagement area is the Northern Corridor from Brisbane into the Moreton Bay region. So how does my role in an art museum have anything to do with widening participation? Well, this intersection occurred through a series of connections during my first year at QT Art Museum when I was acting curator of public programs. In 2012, we had a touring exhibition, Roy Lichtenstein, funnily enough, from the National Gallery of Australia, that we built an education program around, and the only means to cover our costs was to charge schools $120 per class to attend. Then I got a phone call from a school explaining that they would love to come, how the workshop content connected with the Year 10 Visual Arts curriculum, and how the students would benefit from this experience, but there was no way that her students or art budget could afford the fee. I heard through the grapevine about QUT widening participation, so I made one phone call. And as a result of that phone call, widening participation covered the workshop fee and tra transportation and saw an opportunity to connect further with their partner schools through our programming and cultural venues. And now, six years on, my role and programs are fully funded through widening participation. QUT Precincts is not a university faculty. We are a university art gallery, among other cultural assets. And that gives us an opportunity to connect in a unique way. Now, there are five conditions which must, must all be met before low socioeconomic school leaver and adult students enter higher education, being awareness, aspiration, affordability, achievement and access. With the visual arts programmings we deliver, the focus is on achieving the first two. Now, I'm going to translate these five conditions from the context of demystifying university to be applicable to art museums. Awareness. How are you communicating, marketing and connecting with this audience? Aspiration or inspiration through your exhibition and public programming as well as facilities. What is the hook that will inspire attendance? Affordability of transport, the eateries, the exhibition ticket and in some instances can this audience afford not to be working and earning an income for their families? Achievement can translate into ownership. Are they convinced that art is for them or that they are welcome in these venues? Access, logistically and physically. For us, it can take students up to two hours to reach QUT campus in Brisbane City, the same distance it takes these students to travel to our state venue. Now, briefly highlighting the barriers that have to be overcome just for a school excursion. We've got risk assessment, timetabling, school approvals, return permission slips, transportation, lunches, curriculum co connection, increased student anxiety. And in some instances, students who have poor attendance, poor grades, behavioural issues and unpaid school fees 
these being key traits of disadvantage, these students are not allowed to go on school excursions, so we go to them. To overcome all the barriers, we need a multi-point engagement model of reaching students through varying channels to overcome the restrictions in place. QUT Precincts currently has six models of engagement, which are always being adapted and reviewed to maximise its effectiveness. These engagements are through programming that happens online, in school, in, sorry, in communities and online. Studies prove that the most effective way to demystify universities to bring those students onto campus, although now, as you may know, the most disadvantaged may not even get that opportunity. So we go to them, into their schools, delivering curriculum connected programs. Now a more recent study has shown that we need to be doing more than in school to influence and involve parents. And as a result of this, we are soon to pilot an in communities engagement model in partnership with the Moreton Bay Regional Council of a Saturday club leading to a celebratory exhibition, opening event and a suite of student led public programs. As stated by Dr. Leanne Fry from the University of Newcastle, low socioeconomic students from a high culture capita are more likely to aspire to go to university. Why? Specifically, visual arts programming has the ability to create and build upon personal identity, self-knowledge, awareness and expression, expanded career horizons and desirable work skills, community engagement and empathy, a sense of belonging, just to name a few. If you are given the opportunity to explore, realise or reconcile who you are and where you come from, then you are more equipped to know where you are going and these explorations can be achieved through visual arts. Strategies we use to achieve this include providing an authentic art experience, embracing a variety of perspectives and voices, demystifying career and study pathways, embedding role playing, embracing partnerships um, um, and embracing participatory workshops with the core program objective being to enable a student-led discovery of self. To be completely honest, delivering these programs are not easy. They involve a matrix of complexities, but they are worth the long-term investment and commitment when you see firsthand the transformations, realisations and aspirations of these students. Everyone deserves the right to access education and thrive through the power of visual arts. So let's do this. I'm going to make a start. Uh, what I'm going to present to you today is the uh, last 11 years of um, working as the head of faculty at uh, Beacon Hills College and the artist in residency programs that um, I've been involved with, both at a local, national and international way. Uh, I did my postgraduate here in Canberra and then uh, went back to Melbourne and uh, completed um, uh, about 100 exhibitions during the 80s and 90s, and also around about uh, 150 residencies. This was my first residency at Beacon Hills College, where I worked with students, um, and we uh, created this woven wall hanging, which is about three metres by two metres, um, and is now part of the college collection, which is really important. The next slide here is about uh, what we do in our curriculum. All right, this is a year eight project where we do uh, a, an, a term of the theme using the theme figures in motion and we chose images from that and got an artist to create the mural. And then with the artist and myself, we created the uh, ceramic sculptures. It's really important to encompass the educational offering within the classroom. The next slide coming up is of a slide of an image that um, my sister made, Pam Irving. She's a famous sculptor in uh, Melbourne, famous for her work, Larry Latrobe, a bronze dog in the city square. Together we made um, this work. I made the plinth, she made the dog, and she mosaiced it at school. Lectures and uh, demonstrations occurred throughout the time. It's an important to demystify the process of making art. When I was completing artists in residencies, I built this timber form for a three-seat sofa and I completed um, many concrete chairs or, and mosaic upon them throughout Victoria. This one 
included the local church and school community where we built a ceramic uh, sofa um, as a public art project. It included a lot of people. <clears throat> the next slide is uh, an example how artist in residencies can exist outside the art area. We uh, have an Aboriginal uh, Indigenous educational offering at school where we teach Aboriginal language, culture and tradition and is taught by an Aboriginal teacher, Lynette George. Lynette wanted to uh, include year eights and they drew the local fauna and flora and with um, Auntie Judy and her partner, we created five panels which celebrated the cultural background and area of the school and Bunjil, the eagle, the totem of the southeast. Over the last 10 years at Pakenham, the area has grown and, uh, so, and as such, the school community has grown. And we've employed an artist, Sue Jarvis, a local painter, to tell her story. And in the, this artist in residency, we made as many people that are present within the school and their religious and cultural backgrounds present in the mural. It's a large, about uh, 10 metres in length. The next slide is an artist in residency that was gained from a grant from this, um, the War Memorial Trust and we created a, uh, a ceramic mural led by the artist Rob Matheson um, and we included, we've got a cadet program at school and we include many of these students in creating this mural. It honours our tradition. The next slide, we also included Rob, and we obtained another grant from Uniting Ch Church of South Yarra to help build a mural for the congregation and the church at Pakenham. Um, this mural now hangs proudly on their wall, and, and the school provided the space for the painting of this mural to occur. Within our residencies, we offer opportunities for all sections to in, within the school to be involved. This is a history painting or history mural, part of three panels depicting the history of Australia. We have residencies in early learning centre, middle, junior and senior school. And the final slide that I want to talk about in terms of what we do within the school is that we have a special day called the CESA Day of Excellence. CESA is the Southeastern Independent Schools Association and we have a day where students can come together and meet and learn and greet and be together with artists in the, practition, the, the practice of making art. Our national residencies. We found that the CAM program that we offer at school did not interest creative students. And so we developed a five-day art camp. And our initial ones were at Geelong and we uh, we're at the a place called Art Rocks, and under the guidance of A.D. Lowe, students over two days completed a glass platter, which was then fired on site. And then we also ran classes in painting outdoors, ceramics with blackware firing, and we also ventured out to meet local artists' galleries and even went to sculpture exhibition at Lawn. The next slides are our recent Year 10 art camps where we've gone to Jabiru. This is probably the most profound experiences of my life, where we've gone into retreat spaces with Aboriginals, into their country and into their culture. We've seen Aboriginal working and we've come back into the studios. Uh, we went to and travelled to Orenpindi to watch the artists work. We rubbed shoulders with fellow um, students at school and then we would um, come back into the, the school classroom and with the artist, learn how to make uh, rock paintings. We'd learn how to use the, the local ochres, and we'd also learn how to make brushes out of reeds. So, and it was a great opportunity to uh, work with these people. It's something that we continue on um, each year. 
And my final slide is our international residencies. I've had the great pleasure over the last 10 years to take students to Italy, Greece, New York, and other teachers have taken students to Spain and to um, Canada. This year, I'm going, taking 23 students to New York, where we will um, uh, see, obviously, um, theatre, um, public and private artworks. Um, I've got a brochure down on the floor here which uh, illustrates some of the art activities that we've done in the past 10 years. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Ria Tierney. I'm a relatively new educator. I've been teaching for three years and I teach in North Balconnen and I teach visual art and textiles to students from year six through to year 10. So I'll be talking about a mural project I did with a senior art class last year. So walls have received a lot of negative attention in the media recently. So I wanted to change the rhetoric um, that we have been hearing about, I shall build a wall, to with my, one of my classes, we shall paint a wall. Um, this was a really great book that I read late last year when it came out. If anyone is interested in walls, this is a really good read, A History of Civilization in Blood and Brick. Um, I first needed to find a wall. So I needed a wall that was close to the school I worked at. I didn't want to have to bother with um, booking a bus and the costs associated with that. I also wanted something that was in the students' local area that they walked past, not just when they were at school, but when they walked to their local shops. And um, one that they could point to their friends and family and show them, we painted this. That last slide was the wall before we actually painted it. It was a privately owned wall. It actually belonged to the service station which is behind it, but the owner was really supportive of the project and was really on board. This slide shows um, a diagram of kind of what went into the planning. We worked with the local Canberra artist called James Smalls who had done the mural on the right hand side at our school with a group of indigenous students and he had also worked um, at the Belconnen Youth Centre so he had his working with vulnerable people card and all his clearances so he was fine with coming into the school. We started off our sessions with just rough sketches, brainstorming, round table kind of discussions, what were we going to paint? Um, James came in for those sessions and it was really up to the students to decide what they wanted to do. Here's some initial sketches of ideas. Were we going to have something that represented the school? Were we going to have something that responded to the site? Were we going to have something completely random? Um, there were a few debates between students. Um, there were a few disagreements. Um, and it took some time to actually come up with an idea. We did this post-it note activity. It was a really kind of quick activity and it was kind of just to get the students to think about visually what they could do. So each student got a post-it note and literally five minutes to draw an idea or come up with a a colour theme or something. We did practical workshops, so the students in all had about two hours practice with spray cans. Um, this was a wall at our school behind the art room and um, they learnt how to outline basic lettering, um, how to hold a spray can, how to blend colours, um, really basic techniques. Like I said, they pretty much had two hours practice with spray can before we actually painted the wall. Um, when it came to painting the wall, it was a really hot day, the day that I had organised the excursion. It was out in the sun. Um, I couldn't really change the date. There were two other excursions on the same day. Everything didn't go according to plan at the start of the day. I had about two permission notes. I had to ring parents. It was a bit of a nightmare, but we got there in the end. So the students were split into two groups of eight. 
um, into two sessions. So the first session was 9 to 10.30. So the first group kind of started off painting the entire wall black. I thought that could be a problem with drying. I thought we might have to wait between actually painting the background and actually doing the design. But because it was such a hot day, it wasn't a problem. So there's the wall painted black. Um, please note in these photos too, it looks like there's only like three students in the class. It's just due to the media restrictions on a lot of the students, I haven't actually been able to get a whole group photo of them. Um, so we in painted the entire wall with rollers and James came in and kind of outlined kind of the composition. Each student was then in charge of an area or a colour and it was really interesting because they had to work around each other. It was interesting to see because um, haven't worked on such a large scale with these students before. They were using a really new material um, but it was really good. They worked really well together. Um, and this is probably halfway through the project. So James actually stayed on site during the whole day. So I had to walk the first group back to school and bring the second group back to site to him. And I was kind of worried between those crossover periods, would the wall still be looking like, would it be tagged between those times? But he kind of stayed there and guarded the site. Um, so this is almost finished um, and yeah, pretty much this is a wall once it's done. So it wasn't really about um, the design so much. It was about the students coming up with their own idea, doing something in the community. We had a lot of community support. The ACT government paid for all the materials, paid for James's artist fees, paid for the workshops. Um, some of the things in the admin side um, that took a lot of time was the risk assessment, permission notes, um, grant money, the materials and the artist workshops, figuring out when we were going to do that. And um, I think that's the thing that surprised me most from when I wanted to start the project to my timeline, it was probably off by two months. So I thought it'd take like a month to do it all and it ended up taking about three months. So it got done, but <laughs> thank you.